we're uh, going to take you all through a whirlwind tour of hands-on I2B2 um, uh, projects, which includes, you know, spinning things up in the cloud, uh, ETL, and how, you know, some of the recent tools that we've had uh, developed can kind of get you right into uh, doing some ETL. We have uh, ways that, uh, you know, I2B2, which has been traditionally hard to install, can now be um, installed, you know, with much, much greater ease. And overall, just the privilege of having Kavi Vakolakar and uh, Jeff Klan be able to take us through uh, some of these uh, uh, practices. And, um, and then at the end, we'll have like some open, you know, ways that we can kind of think about, you know, what's happened and, you know, what you all want to happen. So, all right. Thank you, Sean. So unlike uh, the previous sessions that we've had here, the action is not going to happen on the screen. It's going to happen on your laptop. Uh, so I'd encourage you to join, use a Zoom link to join. And that way, you could chat, be part of the conversation. Obviously, you're in this room. And I noticed that there are, I think, 23 people online. Uh, so today morning, I was you know, stuck in traffic, and I was on Zoom. And the conversation was almost like, uh, Pre-COVID times, you know, where people on Zoom become second-degree citizens. You kind of are not aware that they are there. Uh, and in COVID, when everyone was on Zoom, the conversations were so easy. So let's move to Zoom. Uh, I encourage you to get on the link. And uh, so we'll start off with this spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is going to be the house. So there are two tabs to it. The first tab is you. Go and put in your name and uh, and your email. So the moment you put that, you get a workspace. And so that URL is what you could click on and see if you can, for I2B2 instance opens for you. Uh, yeah, and uh, let's, let's do this first. Make sure that you have I2B2 instance to play with. And those of who have a laptop and are more adventurous and want to do something in their own, on their own, uh, you obviously will have a workspace over here. But I'd encourage you to jump right ahead and do this. Click on I2B to install this GitHub site, and just follow the steps. There are four steps, uh, and see. It'll be fun to see if you are able to install I2B to using Docker. Uh, so these environments are all Amazon Linux. And Ubuntu, they should, it should also work on Ubuntu, the latest Ubuntu. That's what uh, we've, we've seen. OK, you all have the link for this. I've put it, in, put it in chat. So this is going to be like an easy flow and expect a lot of crosstalk to happen. It's a hackathon style stuff. Uh, so the agenda is. So we'll set up, we'll get some workspace. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the context of why we are doing this. Uh, and then uh, Jeff, you know, I'd invite Jeff to talk a bit uh, about querying. And you know, uh, many of you might be familiar, but you might not know of the advanced stuff. So Jeff can do that. Uh, Jeff will do that. And then we'll jump on to ETL. So, we, so there's the ETL module, uh, which I think we spoke about in the morning. So we'll get to do some hands on with that. Uh, and and then what you could do is you you get to clean up your workspace and then set up the workspace from scratch. Those are the steps of how to install I2B from scratch. And then you can in the in the remaining half hour you could make your own ontology and you could make your own facts. Obviously, like smaller number, uh, but to get an idea of how the ETL tooling can work. It's not showing up here. Uh, okay, let me see, let me see. Yeah, I think I know what's happening. I need to share my desktop probably. Uh, okay. 
I guess it's there, right? Yeah, perfect. That's the one. And it encourages you to, uh, thanks, Andrea. So I encourage you to put in chat, we'll be monitoring chat, and also speak out over here. Okay, so let's just wait for people to put in their names. And do interrupt if you're stuck. I think you know uh, we'll move ahead when we have everybody's name here on the on this Excel file. Oh, okay, so let me push the link. The link. Uh, this is the link. So tiny URL. So tinyurl.com slash i to be to hands on. Yeah, I'm, that's the Excel file which will open. You know, hands on i to tiny url.com slash i2b2 hands on. I want to make sure everybody has is on this sheet because if you don't are not on this sheet, you're going to lose track. And uh, all the links are there, you know, on, on all the commands and links are it's like a cheat sheet on, on the on the sheet. So those of who have put their names here, is the web link opening? Is the I2B2 instance opening up? Okay, that's good. I promise you that something is going to fail uh, in in the in the live workshop. I don't know what what it is. So these are public instances on Amazon, uh, T3A medium, you know, two, G, mm, two processors, four GB RAM. And uh, you will be in a subsequent step. Once you put your email IDs here, I'll be able to send you the keys so that you can log in and have a shell access. I'll email you the key. Just wait for a while. Still waiting. We just have six people here, and there are seventy workspaces. Yeah, you can. You you are that okay? Perfect. I don't see your name, a name over here on the on the sheet, which. Uh, okay, but do log into the sheet so that I can send you the key, and you can even try this out. I'll, I'll, so the link for the sheet is in the chat. Uh, okay. I'll put. I'll. I'll
this is the link tinyurl.com slash i2b2 hands on. That'll take you to the Google Doc. And you can edit the first two columns, putting in your name and email. And I need your email to send you the keys. OK, we'll move ahead in a minute. And those of you uh, want to come back and just raise your hand, and happy to get you back on this page. So the login is the username demo, and the password is capital ETL at the rate 2021. You can even try logging in as admin, as I2B2. It should work. So these are the two users you always get by default, and the project is always demo. Uh, demo. Are we full? No, no, we've got 70, 70 machines. So, I2B2. I you need to remind me to turn the machines off after the class, otherwise it's going to be a huge bill for running 70 machines. It's OK to run 70 machines for two hours. So what's the context? Like, What's the context for this exercise today? Uh, and I think the context for why we're doing this is, is to be more inclusive. Right? We want, uh, you know, we are here in this room, and there are many people on Zoom. But there are many more who could really be here. And uh, this is an amazing technology which the community has developed for the past in more than 10 years of work, uh, all the people who have done this. So it's really a privilege to, and that is the context, it's really a privilege to make it available and accessible for more people. And I, we always focus on doing something new, but even if we can make what is done by all the heroes here available, that can have a bigger impact than doing something new. So that is the context here. We want to make this more inclusive. And here is a hackathon to see that what we are doing, whether it works or not, and your ideas about how we can make it, in fact, more accessible. I remember uh, the first time I loaded I2B2 as a student, and I saw the hives on the web page. And I felt this is too complicated. I was doing my informatics page. It's too complicated. And I didn't bother to come back to the page for a while. Uh, and I tried, but then I saw XML, and I really didn't use it in my, you know, in my, uh, in my work. Move, fast forwarding ahead, uh, when I was finished my PhD, I was doing into, going into research. My institution was evaluating whether to install I2B2 or not. And uh, that question was delegated to uh, one of our staff members who was my cube mate. And he tried for several months to install I2B2. And uh, uh, it was difficult. And you know the verdict was that we should look at something new, something else. 
moving ahead when i joined here as you know uh, joined shans group and i was sitting next to mike uh, and i had the luxury of asking him over the you know how to install idb2 it still took me a lot of effort uh, and when i i've been coming to these conferences and i, I never felt that i understand idb2 so i say anyone in this room who understands idb2 i bet even shawn doesn't understands all of it i mean he has architected it but i'm sure he's not written the code there are always parts so i feel that feeling of completeness one is never going to get you are not never going to know all the parts which are there but if we can give people the confidence that okay this is easy this is understandable we can be more inclusive and so shans as has encouraged this work that okay we started with docker and people started using it and it was helpful and we have tried to go even further up to make it like maybe three line install and so on at least the installation step and then the etl part and even even how how the internals work okay so that's a context uh, i want to stop here you have access so i will work on sending you the email keys i want to invite jeff to talk about query though all might you might be familiar with it but believe me you, you may not be even i thought i knew everything about query uh, but there are a lot of uh, advanced ways of querying which sometimes may be helpful but i think it's good so jeff in, in, over to you and then we'll come back and uh, we'll look at etl Can you can you also um, pull I pull up the ITP2 web client for the VM that I picked so I can run through the Okay, you want the website? Uh, yeah. Oh, VM that you picked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You can switch. So that way, I'll yeah, 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 switch back and forth. I I do it. I can do it. I know how to know how to use a Mac. So where is your Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Is that? That's your. That's what. That's yeah. what everyone's seeing. Yes. Everybody's seeing that. Oh. <laughs> we should probably just go to regular presenter. Regular presenter. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's full, yeah, full screen, yeah. All right, great. On the Zoom, I mean, this oh, is, this yeah, is still but that. we have a much more sophisticated setup than most, so. What should we do? Should we? So you yeah. can, if you stop the, not stop, yeah. if you stop the presentation, yeah. and what did I do? Did I yeah, you just switch okay. on the screen. No, but that I wanted to go to setup setup show. Throw your Yeah, I guess I could maximize and get rid of the menu bar. But okay, I think we're I think we're good. All right, so that that was the plan. So you'd have a couple extra minutes to get set up. Really, um, okay. I'm going to talk about the I2B2 query tool, 
not the new one that Nick is putting together, but the current one, just to show the basic things you can do with it. I'll do this quickly if this is something that's going to be extremely boring to everyone. Who in the room has not used the I2V2 query tool to develop queries and drag things around and stuff like that? OK, all right. So there's some people. OK, so I'll, I'll um, hopefully keep everyone's interest. We'll see. So the I2V2 design of the software, uh, and this is you know 15 years ago when Sean architected it, was to have every component of I2B2 as a separate piece that has its own server-side component, its own XML messages for a REST interface, its own database. And, and so the, you know, the I2B2 ontology, which provides all of the uh, terms and the hierarchy and the semantics for querying, is a separate unit from the CRC, which is the data. And that's where the data lives. So when you're setting up I2B2, You'll set up uh, an ontology uh, cell. Well, the, the cell the, these are called cells, but the cells are all kind of installed as a as a unit now in the Wildfly install. But you'll you'll set up some data tables for for your ontology and some for the CRC and some for these other um, components and optional components, um, which which probably you won't need to do I, I think with Javi's Docker. But if you're doing this, if you do it at home, then you might need that. Um, and as we've talked about through this whole conference, I2B2 <clears throat> tries to be very flexible in terms of kind of being a data sponge where you can put data into it and then use an ontology to provide a window into that data. And you can layer different ontologies on top of the same data. We, talk here, we talked here today and yesterday a lot about the ACT ontology. That's kind of the, the best harmonized shared thing. But people have developed their own ontologies. And these are just a few examples of of I2B2 ontologies. And so from the beginning, when, <clears throat> when this was put together, um, the goal was to have like a self-service query tool. So researchers wouldn't have to write a complex SQL query to get an answer to how many diabetic patients are in the population. They could just pull up a web interface and um, <clears throat> drag some things into different panels, click a button, and get a count back. So you've seen. A demonstration already of the new the new version of this that's that's going to be coming out next year. Um, so this is the this this is the the current version, which is based on uh, work that was done like 15 years ago. And you you take things from the ontology shown there on the left on the left side, and you drag them to the right side, and that becomes your query. And this interface, um, the panels represent. Uh, ands of different things. And the things in a panel are ORed together. So here we dragged a, a set of ages into the first panel. So this, you know, we dragged 18 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54. So that this panel is a query for patients aged 13, sorry, 13, 18 to 64 years old. Because those are all ORed together. And then the second panel is patients with diabetes mellitus. And that is anded with the first one, so diabetic patients between 18 and 64 years old. So that's how you build a simple query. You drag those things over from the ontology, put them in an arrangement like this, and then you click the Run Query button at the bottom, yeah, up there on the, on the bottom, and then uh, it, it pops up a dialog box allowing you to select what you want the query to return. Um, the top. Interesting. In, in this one, patient set is, is uh, highlighted. But the, the first one is, should be uh, counts, patient counts. And that's, that's your basic I2B2 query, where you get um, a, a, a number of patients back. <clears throat> and depending on your user access, that might be an obfuscated number, where it says like 5,034 plus or minus 10 or something. Or you might get the exact number if you have sufficient access, and that's controlled by an administrator, so you can you know, set this up according to what's allowed by your IRB. But there are a lot of other types of queries you can run in I2B2. You can run a patient set query, which doesn't look particularly different, but 
uh, after you get your count back, you can go into um, the previous query menu. I can show this live in a minute. You can go into the previous query menu and uh, drill down. And if you have sufficient access, you can see the patient pseudo identifiers for all the patients that were in that, that set that you counted. And then you can use that patient set as an object in various plugins. You can drag that patient set into a plugin, um, like some, some plugin, data export plugin. Like you start with a patient set and you add some concepts to it. So you run a query, create a patient set, and then drag that over to data export plugin. Um, and then there, there are other ones. A lot of them are uh, these breakdowns that if you were here for the ETL group, Mike was talking about some advanced things you can do with those. But those, those will kind of automatically run a bunch of queries, but more efficiently than it would be to run a bunch of queries. So you could do like a sex breakdown or a gender break, I'm sorry, sex breakdown or a race breakdown. It'll give you, um, you know, so if you do both, then you get uh, for all patients, whether they're male, female, uh, other unknown. And then for each race, you'll also get a count. So you get the full count and then the, the sub counts. Um, so so that's, the, that's the, the magic you can do with the query tool. There's also a, a temporal query tool, which you may have heard referenced. I am not planning, I don't have um, questions in the question section for exercises that are about temporal query, but I can show it if people are interested. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the I2V2 data model, possibly interesting to people. The, the core of the data model is this giant fact table. So every patient, um, I'm sorry, every, everything that happens to every patient gets a row in the fact table. So a patient gets a diagnosis of diabetes, row in the fact table. A patient gets a hemoglobin A1C test, row in the fact table. So it's a very long table, but with proper indexing and whatnot, you can query this very, very quickly. Uh, so it's a very efficient computational way of storing and querying data it's not you know, intuitive for a uh, data analyst to write a script to, to query that, but that's, we have a lot of data transforms to make that more intuitive. And then there are these dimension tables. This is called a star schema. You have at the center of the star, you have a big table, and then you have the points of the star, and that's uh, patient dimension, visit dimension, uh, concept dimension. Those are the key ones, and there are a few others. So you, th those are tables with specific columns that you know, have information that you don't want to reuse. So the patient dimension has like a column for uh, gender and for uh, race. Um, you could store those in the fact table, and some people do. So every patient would then have a fact for race, fact for gender. But um, it's, it's since everybody has those things, it's intuitive to just put it in a table with columns. So if you're if you're uh, like so familiar with OMOP or PCORnet, they have lots of tables with very specific things in them, and that's kind of what you're seeing with the patient dimension for the for patients, for patients only. Um, you can of course link I2B2s together as we've talked about today and yesterday uh, with the Shrine interface, and uh, have federated queries across entire data networks, um, and uh, yeah, there's also uh, work that has happened in upcoming work on putting genomic data into I2B2. So you can take uh, VCF files, variant call format, that uh, if I understand them correctly, it's basically uh, a list of SNPs that are, are interesting for a patient. And those can be imported into I2B2 in a variety of ways. And we have some import tools that, that will do that. But just, this is just to highlight the I2B2 data model is not limited to, um, to just uh, clinical EHR data. Um, and you also can use I2B2 to, to query different data models. Um, I did some work a few years ago querying the PCORnet data model on I2B2. Um, most recently, Michelle has been doing some work on getting OMOP uh, queryable in I2B2. So you, because of the flexibility of the data model, you can layer um, <clears throat> layer other data models underneath the I2B2 data, data model and alongside it and query those with the same interface. So that was more context than you probably needed. But um, I, I created just a few exercises so people could run some queries. So if you want to go to your um, 
your web client from Kavi's spreadsheet, or uh, you could also go to the demo site, itp2.org slash web client, if you didn't sign up for a, a VM. Uh, we'll just run some queries. I'm gonna jump out of the presentation mode and we can, you can just follow along here and I'll, I'll do the queries at the same time in, the, in my browser. So the first thing we're gonna do is find how many females had circulation, circulatory system disease and create a bar chart by age. And let's see, go to this. I assume I have to type the password. Okay, so, um, all right, Any, anybody know how I find the, the number of female patients? Sh shout out, uh, yes, yeah, sure, you can raise your hand, you can just shout. <laughs> all right. drag fell. This is, I don't know what happened. Okay. All right. So we've got a query for female patients. Now, how do we get female patients with circulatory system disease? Diagnosis. So circulatory system. So, so do we, do we drag it here or here? Yeah, no. with circulatory system disease. You guys are good. It's almost like you know how to do this for me. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so the thing that's checked by default is number of patients. It isn't the one on the top. Um, <clears throat> All right, and we, oh, it al I also had wanted a, what did I say in there, an age breakdown? I think it said an age breakdown. Uh, so we'll click age breakdown. And let's do patient set just to show that off. Oh, I I did patient set, so it's not going to show. Oh, it's not going to show me anything else. Let's run it again. Does it? Yeah, but it's not showing the. Uh, Yeah, right, right. Wait, I, 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 I guess I'm confused. I don't know. So wait, there's a, the window. Oh, no, no, no. I was trying to find the, the results, the, the graph of the, of the age breakdown. Um, yeah, I think that, there we go. There we go. So uh, I don't want to do that because I don't do it. This is, I think, the previous one, not the new, the latest one. Yeah, 12A. All right, so. Yeah, I, there's always something. We did promise something is going Yeah, did you, did you know that if you click patient set, it doesn't show you the breakdown? No. I, I, okay. <laughs> There. All right, so if we go back to queries, where was my query? You can open, no, that was my count query, I think. Here, so if you can open up the previous queries. I had the opportunity to name the query before I ran it, but if you don't name it, it gives you something with the start of the first term and a timestamp. And if I go to the one that was a patient set and I open it up, you see that there are a few different things. There's a um, an age breakdown, number of patients, and a patient set. And if I drill into the patient set, I can see all the patients and their uh, gender and their race, actually. 
So um, those are those are I2B2 pseudo identifiers. This is all fake data, so this doesn't <clears throat> doesn't matter. But um, you know, if you're setting this up for an administrator or for users, you want to consider whether the pseudo identifier is still identifi identifiable and be careful with that. Um, next thing, how many patients had circulatory system disease and a CPK test of greater than or equal to 400? Um, so, so I'm not used to your mouse pro. All right, so should we, so we could click clear to get rid of the whole query. Or, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, the yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't, you're right, you're absolutely right, click the X to get rid of the view, I, it's like, <laughs> you and I both like know the query field too well, but it's kind of fun. Um, so circulatory system and then CPK test, I don't know where that is in the ontology, so I'm going to demo find terms. It's an under cardiac. Yeah. Okay. So I could go. Looks like I have two different link codes for here for this. Um, so when you query for a lab, you get this dialog that lets you choose a lab range, and it conveniently has um, colors to indicate the normal range. And that only exists if the ontology has defined the normal ranges. Um, I, I mean, we, we've had some discussions about this a few years ago because you, know, you create an ontology for ACT, and you, if you if you put an extra work that, like Michelle, then you have normal ranges. But those normal ranges might not be the same as your labs. They'll be close, but they won't be quite the same. So, uh, so this is the normal range the ontology defines, not necessarily the data, and. We wanted to say it was greater than 400, but that's a percent. So I think this is the wrong term. Yeah. Okay. So this is the one that's actually you know, that's nanograms per milliliter. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. At one point, I did put this together based on like actual results. I should I should do all the CPKs, shouldn't I? Oh, that one. So this is a an enumerated list. You can define you can define values this way, where the value is not a number but is a set of predetermined values. The CKMB. Oh, CPK. Yeah. So you think this is the this is the secret one? Oh, here. Yeah. It is a Mac. All right. So you know, I'm realizing as I did this that you might notice this is all in the same panel. So this is actually circulatory system disease or a CPK above 400. So it's going to be much bigger than, um, uh, than. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay, we got five. It happened. <laughs> Did it. <laughs> oh, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> um, 
Okay, using the query from 1A, find the number of patients with the diagnosis before 11, 2005. All right, we can do this, we'll get there. So I could clear out the query and rebuild the query that we had in one. I could delete the first panel and start with that and drag over female or previous query. So if I go to the queries tab, I can see all the queries that I ran. This is a female circulatory system. So I just drag it, if I drag it up to the top here where it says query name, it will reload that query and then I can run it again. Interestingly, if you drag it into a panel instead, then you can use it as a piece for another query. So it's a secret way of actually doing more complex Boolean logic with ITB2 queries without you know having the complexity in the user interface um kind of yeah yeah that's right that's right so you can uh, you can do an, an an or of several previous queries or an or of a previous query and and a, a diagnosis code and yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're going to do this in the next video. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are, these are, these are the things that, uh, you know, we, we talk about the ITV2 query tool is powerful and everyone's like, well, the UI is ugly. But it actually does do a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. So they can, they can see the magic. Yeah, Michelle made some very complex queries to query for patients with di with really diabetes, not just the diagnosis code. And there were like five different queries. They're all like ordered together. It was very, it was cool. Yeah. So uh, this, the question I had put here was before a, a diagnosis before November 2005. So if you didn't see what I clicked on there, there's this little date button, which, uh, which will bring up a date from or to. So you can add a date constraint. And um, you can do a per panel date constraint that way, I think. You can do it per element as well. Yeah, you're right. I was, isn't there a way to do it for the whole query? No, it's by or by element, yeah. Yeah, so you, right, you can right click on the element and you can set a date constraint there or delete an individual item. Um, and so you, you get a little UI indication of that with the the number in brackets. And uh, I don't know, will this work? Okay, gave us a number. Sounds good to me. Cool. So which one was our patients that query? This one? So I want to I want to make sure this works because I'm curious. So if we clear this query out and we put a date constraint on the patient cell, what would happen? Oh no! 
Yeah. Oh, so it's only looking at, yeah, okay. Oh, I see, I see, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, I have another slide of these things, two more. Um, repeat 1C with three or more occurrences of circulatory system disease. So do I have to drag circulatory system over three times? Uh, which was this? There are so many magical little buttons in this UI. So uh, occurs, there we go. And what did I say, three or more? More than two. More than two is three or more, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Any text, all right. And so that will lessen the bar. Yay. And how many patients from that query used a cardiovascular agent medication? That one doesn't, isn't too tricky. You just take that query and add uh, cardiovascular agents and drag it, run it. Two patients, so not very many. Um, okay, so that was like the that was the exercises. But I also I have a slide in here. I think on the timeline, I want to show the timeline because that's also a lot of fun. Um, so what this um, this is probably better than the one that'll come up on the screen. So this shows by patient. It shows the uh, date of the event. So. Uh, whatever the event, I mean, there can be multiple events and then it'll show it in a tooltip. But if the event is a diagnosis of circulatory system disease, it'll show a little tick mark when the patient got that diagnosis. And you can look, you know, look across the, all your patient data. And in order to do this, the administrator has to give the, the user access to, uh, I think, is it limited? Is it LDS or data? Probably data, right? Data prod. Yeah, because this is that's you know that's seeing dates, so that's more than just. Yeah, yeah. So this th that is a plugin. Um, That, that would be great. Let's see if this works. There we go. Yeah, so you see the patients that, I think it's only showing 10 results because they have size 10 in the little box there. That's the default. I mean, one downside of this is it's a little bit slow because it gets a, a big XML chunk of data on every patient back. And so it does take a little bit of time, but less time than writing a SQL query to do, that, do it yourself. Um, and these little tick marks represent the event date. And I think, yeah, if I mouse over it, it shows the specific ICD code because I dragged over a folder that was circulatory system. And so there, are multiple codes underneath that, and so it shows me the exact code. Um, I don't know, I guess it doesn't show me the exact date. Oh, here, if you click on it, learning things too. If you click on it, then it shows you the 
the actual fact, the data about the facts. So you get the start date and the end date, the code, the um, units, the modifier. Yeah. Does the frequency that it's going to air, is that what they become, or is that like another level, like, um, like a patient? Another level? I think it's the patient known. You mean the patient? I think it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the event ID. So is the event ID the visit ID? Yeah, so it's the encounter number. Yeah, yeah, it's all synonyms for each other, right? It's all the same thing, kind of. All right, so those are some cool things you can do with I2B2. Uh, um, Kavi, do I have time to do a temporal query, or should I take, take my leave and let you take over? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so in the in the very latest ITV two one point seven point thirteen, we did put a tab um, next to query tool to go to the temporal query. I don't I don't know that if the new UI is going to have that, but. We wanted to highlight the temporal query is like a whole section of the query tool. And the, the only way previously to get to it was to click on this query timing and go down to temporal events. But it takes you to a completely different interface for, for developing queries. There are actually two versions of this interface. There's the simple one, which ha has a, you know, maybe a nicer UI. And there's a complex one, which lets you use the full power of the API to build temporal relationships. Um, so, we need to drag a query over, a concept over. So let's drag circulatory system. Um, so we, the default is occurrence, the first ever observation A occurs before the first ever observation B. And so the first observation of circulatory system disease occurs before what? Before what? The drug, that's a good idea. Hey. Hey. Okay. I'm having a lot of trouble driving. Yeah, and some of the problem is just I'm having trouble dragging on the screen. I got, I did, I had it that time, yeah. Okay. Oh, it, it, it didn't let me. Oh, I'm fine. This is like a tiny little screen. <laughs> it's like way below my, like my line of sight. <laughs> no idea what's going on. Uh, um, yeah, so I think what actually might be happening is I might be fighting with YUI. Every once in a while we run into this problem where why UI doesn't let you drag? Um, hey. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well. All right, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't clap for me for that. That was embarrassing. <laughs> but
but but yeah, there is a there is a weird issue in YUI sometimes where it won't let you drag, and if you just refresh the ontology or you can refresh the whole browser, then it does. But that will go away very soon. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the first ever circulatory system occurrence, disease occurrence occurs before the first cardiovascular medication. Um, you can, can also, but don't actually have to, define a constraining population. So you could say like only among, um, it's easier to do gender than age. Let's say only a, among, oh, okay, circulatory systems also in the constraining population already. That's good. And, uh, and we want only, only men for the sake of this query and count the number of patients. So I don't know if it's gonna be greater than zero. This is only 133 patient data set. Hey, we got it too, so. Yeah, and of course you can you can develop a lot more complicated things than that. You can add more more uh, panels to the temporal query. You can also change the relationship here from the start of the first ever to the end of any or the last ever, um, and then you can you know with a separation of days. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of thought was put into to the design behind this. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I know, I understand your question. Um, I mean, one, one way you can do it is you can use a, a previous query in the, in the temporal query uh, panel. And the, the question was, can you do an or, like did the patient have circulatory system or asthma before they used cardiovascular medication? Um, I, I, yeah, I think the, way, the only way to do that, does any, anyone else know? That, uh, maybe I'm missing something. I think the only way to do that in this interface is to use a previous query as well. Um, there, yeah. Okay, let's let's change the circulatory system and asthma. Then how do you do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so this is the this is the advanced temporal query view. There's a little button in the corner, and you can create a full panel here. So th this is the constraining population. You can go to event one, and you could create an or of things that way, um, and ands and ors of things that way. And you can so for each event, then you can create a full query, um, and then you can define the order of events there. So. Is it, does that help you with? Yeah, you can add. You can add a lot of. Wait, what does it say there? <laughs> yeah, I know. What is it? What is the dial? I don't know either. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. I'm not sure why it's complaining, but you can add more events, so you can make this infinitely complex and slow, but. Let's you do all that stuff. Okay, I think that's. Is there, is there stuff I didn't show that I should? That's, that's what I had planned. Yeah, no, I didn't. Should I show the same financial encounter? All right. Really good. I was fine patients. Fine patients. Yeah, I will. Uh, oh, that's the problem. Okay. Non 
Yeah. So, much more time Oh, I can stop whenever you want. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> you have a lot of stuff to show. Um, I, I just want to show the same financial encounter real quick, just so people know what it is. So the query timing has three options. You can have non-temporal query, which is your normal query. Uh, and then you can also choose non-temporal query, but sequence occurs in the same, selected groups occur in the same financial encounter. And then you have the temporal query. So same financial encounter, this is, a, a, again, the, the fuzziness in what's in the visit dimension. Th this means that the, these two things have to occur. Okay, that doesn't, that won't work because it's a, let's do the cardiovascular, cardiovascular agents. So if we do the same financial encounter, and then these have to have the same visit um, ID for both of those queries. And there are none, because I think all these things occur in separate visits in the demo data. But if your system is designed so that you use the visit dimension table for real financial encounters, you can query it that way as well. All right, I should get out of here before. <laughs> I find more problems in the web client. Yeah. Oh, hi, Mark. Hi. So, um, regarding the same financial encounter. Yeah. In my experience, it's very beneficial when you when you want to do when you're looking for diagnoses or whatever. For patients of a particular age range, then it's very beneficial to use the same financial encounter mm -hmm. and go for the age at visit, not the age in mm -hmm. the demographics, but in the visit details mm -hmm. or the age at visit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very powerful query and a very good use of the of the um, same financial encounter. Mm -hmm. Just want to share that. Thank you. That's 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 great. I mean, for that to work, you have to. The financial encounter has to be kind of encompassing of something, right? Because a patient, if you have multiple things you're looking for, the facts might occur in different visits, but that's it's a very good use case. Um, any other thoughts on the query tool? All right. <clears throat> we'll be around if you have more. We'll take all that time. Thanks, sir. No. Jeff said he'll require 20 minutes, and he spoke for one or five minutes. So, <laughs> so it's all good, you know. The I, <laughs> I mean, this is what we are here for, right? Uh, so I feel the I2B2 conference is like the child coming home at the end of the day. You know, the whole year, you go back to your institutions and you're working on stuff. And then you come here and you want to show, and everybody here wants to show what you've done, right? It's almost like when your, your kid tells you, at, when you're at the end of the day, this is what I did in the day, right? And you have all those emotions up and down. So, okay, <laughs> anyway, so uh, moving ahead on the agenda. But that was a good discussion, and, you know, and that's a learning point about you know, that you can actually drag a query, uh, a result of the patient set, and use that as a query. That was a learning point from me. So what I'm going to present the ETL pipeline is actually assimilating all those nitty gritties you know, over the years from Mike and Sean and Jeff, and we're trying to put that into the pipeline. So let's look at that. I think the sheet was here. So let's see where we are with. Okay. Okay, so we finished item three, uh, three querying. And now let's, oh, I have to share my screen. Thanks for reminding me. Yes, That's good. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Okay, now in your instance, I hope you did not, uh, there's a new tab over there. I'm going to use Jeff's instance. Do you see this ETL tab here? Can you click on that? And the, the button delete will show up. I would say for now, don't press it. 
So when you press delete, it's going to delete. So you have got a project. And when you press delete, as a user, so you, and you're a special user here, you're not a normal user, you have the ability to drop all the data in that project. It's a CRC, you know, CRC and the ontology cell combined together for a project. Uh, OK, so before you do that, why don't you try and upload there were two, you must have got an email. If you have put your name in the sheet, you must have got an email. And there are two files. There's a concept.csv and a fact.csv. You upload. Say, choose file, and you upload both the files and see what happens. In case you did not put your name in the sheet, you still can go and do that. You know that the links are there in the agenda. So the links are there over here, the concept file and the C fact file. You can get it in, in case you don't have the email. And you can try this. This is the concept and the fact file. Oops. So did something happen when you did it work? Are you able to see uh, see uh, new elements in the ontology on the left? And are they draggable? Can you drag and run a query? So let me quick, quickly do it here. So I'm going to say choose file. And I think I have it over here. So you saw labs. And you're able to drag. And you can run a query, let's say less than 200. So what really did ha what really happened here? What is what is happening? When you are loading these files, the ETL process is getting kicked. And I put a picture of what the ETL process is doing. You know, I've got a non-PHI non computer and a PHI computer. Hence, like uh, the stuff about moving. OK. I guess uh, you're able to see that, right? OK, this is for the facts. Oops. I think I got disconnected. Did I?
Yeah, it's sharing the screen. I think I got disconnected, probably. Don't say anything on Zoom, right? It is stuck over there. OK. Thanks, Mark. I guess it's showing correctly now. OK, these are the steps which are happening in the pipeline in the back end. Uh, so the concept module is totally different. So in the concept module, first you are getting uh, the concept. It's figuring the type is there. It's generating the metadata XML. and uh, for populating the metadata files, then the concept dimension, right? So it's taking care of that. And this is for the fact file. So it's first retrieving, uh, you know, what are the patient mapping from the database, right? And then it is uh, generating patient numbers for those MRNs which are kind of new. And then it is pushing that to the database, uh, the I2E2 tables. And uh, so patient mapping, patient data uh, dimension, encounter nums, and then finally generating a de-identified uh, you know, the fact where the MRN is replaced by the patient num, and then it is uploading that using BCP or whatever the you know, fast tool is. So this, the performance is like around 16,000 facts a second. Uh, so I think that's, that's the tool. Again, we look at how this is integrated in GitLab, uh, how, how this tool works with GitLab. So let's get back to your instance, and let's, I think now you can press the delete button and see, you know, what happens. This time, why don't you modify the concept file and the fact file and make your own concepts? So this way, you'll be able to make your own ontology. An ontology is nothing but the path that you put. You put a code, and you indicate the type. Actually, in the next version, you won't even have to put type, just two columns. The, because the type will be automatically figured out from the fact file. Obviously, you could add other columns, and there are other types. You could put float, integer, uh, string, long string, large string. The large string goes in the blob uh, in the I2V2 table. And you notice that this black, you're getting a feedback. It tells you that this row might be wrong, or this is a mistake that you might have made. Obviously, this tool is just for learning and for initial testing, right? In production system, you would be running the pipeline in the back end. And this tool is just for troubleshooting. Like, oh, you get stuck, stuck somewhere. Where did my format go wrong? You know, what, what is going on? It's a feedback for you. Was anyone able to upload their own ontology, their own concept file? Works. Anybody else?
And obviously these CSV files won't be produced by hand. You would have a SQL query running in your source database and you'd get these CSV files. So here is what is happening. Right? Uh, each of the EHR systems has got a complex relational database. What you see on the left, right? And when you put them in I2B2, and we are simplified here, they're just two tables, concept and fact. You're kind of denormalizing. Your de your what information took less space, actually your it's going to take more space over here because it's, these tables are redundant. Right? The, the fact table is redundant, right? So it's denormalized, but it is so easy to work with. Everybody understands this format. So if you have got a new programmer joining your team, a new person, IT person joining your team, they won't have to spend months to understand the native data structure. They can work with this. I think that's that's really why I2B2 has been so successful. Because this is what you do, that is what you have been doing, essentially. You have been collapsing your complex relational ontologies into this denormalized form. And we're just calling it out. This is what you have been doing all along. So the next step, what could you do? You, what, what you could do is you just have to write SQL statements for every type of data that you want to pull. And you put those SQL st statements in a directory, and then you point a tool at it. It will execute all those SQLs and generate those these fax files, and it will push them into the I2B2 database. Right. So note that your work has you no know, the the idea of loading I2B2 now. No longer you don't need to know the internal tables of I2B2. You just need to know how to prepare this four column file from your native database. And it is our hope that this is going to make it so much easy for people to deploy and load I2B, load data into I2B2. Uh, towards the end, I think we have time, I'll show the video, and it's available online also, how you could set GitLab, how you could set up GitLab locally to uh, move this, do this movement every night, or you know uh, every so often. So you have a GitLab project, you can set up a GitLab runner, and uh, the base images are available online, the Docker images. And you can trigger, put put your SQL statements for your source database, and it will it will move move the data uh, into into I2B2. Okay, let me stop here. Any any questions were were you able to load their ontology? What they what next? Uh... Now, those of you who really want to install I2B2, okay, you can try connecting. I've I, uh, I've sent you the key, right? Are you able to SSH into the machine using the key? Is it working? Yeah. You could now. remove whatever is there and try installing I2B2 from scratch, right? And the way to remove what is there is to issue these two commands. Sorry about that. Say docker remove the existing containers and say docker volume prune. See, notice that your database right now is running as a docker container. In, in production, it often will be somewhere living somewhere else, but now you want to clean it up. So you go to a blank system with only has I to be, only has Docker enabled on it. So this is the git, uh, after you've cleaned it, you go to the GitHub for I2B2 Docker install and just do these four steps. 
to have your I2B2 back again, a fresh one. You could choose Postgres or MSQL, but really for this stack, we want to focus on Postgres moving ahead because it's free and we really want to optimize it for Postgres as far as this project is concerned. Any thoughts, any questions till now? Okay, maybe at this point I want to digress a little bit and talk about what happens when you really simplify stuff. Uh, I want to show you a small demo. So this is a population level fact, something called as a table. This is still in closed source, but this is like, you just want to give a heads up about the concept, right? And, and, and what is possible if you make, if you're able to simplify the I2B2 loading and the, the process, right? So notice that, notice an extra tab here, it's called tabulation. And it allows you to build a table. So in I2B2, when you run something, you get back a count. But on its own, the count is not helpful. It has to be have a context, uh, right? Imagine running, a, making a two by two table, you need to run four queries, right? So in this example, you can see how you can really generate a summary table from your I2B2 data. So you're going in, you're dragging in the columns, Then you're dragging, dragging in the row headers. And notice the button save and compute. You're saving, you're saving the table as a concept in the ontology. It'll appear as a concept in the ontology. It's a population level concept. And that wireframe of the table is in the concept blob. And this is what you get, actually. I should say you show you this table. That's a bit confusing. This is what you get back. You got back the mean, the standard deviation, number of patients who have low-density lipoprotein, right? And there are actually six, there are nine different parameters that you can choose in this dropdown the first quartile, the fourth quartile, and so on, right? The summary statistics. So you're able to generate this table on your I2B2 data. Imagine adding one more column here in the end called the p-value. And you can see on the left, there's a new slot called as tabulation. And this table is available as a fact. So there is a, each table is a fact. It's a population level fact because it's not tied to one patient. The patient ID is zero. And you can go to this tab and you can, uh, you can 
every time the data is updated, new data comes in, this table can be computed again, and you will have a, re a refresh table. Now it's also possible to configure multiple I2B2 instances, just like you do in Shrine, in a network. And when you execute the query on the mother node or the parent, you get the res responses from the children. Right, I'm gonna show you that table. This is how it looks. See the first column, you've got child one and child two. And you've got a result from each child, and that's what you see in the parent. The parent node has got no data. The children have computed the summary variables, and they are pushing the population level fact to the parent. And that's what you see over here. So you're able to do statistics at the level uh, across the grid. And there is no push happening. The chil there is no call going from the parent to the children. There's no query going. The children are doing get calls to get concept calls to the parent, find out, okay, is there a job for me? And they're pushing, doing a post fact so when you have that API, when you define what's a fact, when you define what's a concept, and you have an API, this kind of stuff is possible. This is still in the works. There's a lot of work to be done. I want to stop here. I want to, you know, uh, uh, maybe we can talk. If you've got time, we can talk about GitLab. But I'll forward you the video of how you can have GitLab set up. It's all recorded on, on YouTube, how you can have GitLab set up to move the data. Uh, but I guess a lot of people here are not exactly working on the, you know, on, 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 on uh, so I'll leave that for later. So I want to hand it over to Sean to summarize in, you know, in the end. And <laughs> so this was a teaser, just to motivate you to think simple and be more inclusive. Uh, and I think we we are all getting towards it. Uh, we we are all are are, are making. Uh, are doing that. Uh, okay, Sean, I mean, over to you. I have nothing. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess this is the last half hour of our. Uh, of our meeting. Um, it's been great. I'm especially pleased to see those folks who are still here because I think that's very symbolic of, um, you know, people who true, true blue, right? True, absolutely. And um, I thought, you know, what we, 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 if you, you know, we've got Sham, we've got Kavi, we've got Jeff. Um, and maybe just have a discussion about um, where you all are seeing things going from the point of view of um, healthcare data is very tough to use in many ways, right? I mean, you think you kind of have a query, but you but you don't really, because you don't have a really good idea of like what the quality of the data is underneath it. The temporal aspects can be very confusing sometimes. Um, and so what you get as a result is something that you're not really sure is usable or, or not, right? And so what in some ways you really need is some assurance that um, you know, when you write a query and you get a result that the numbers that are being reflected in terms of whether that clinical trial is feasible or whether you have you know, a certain incidence and prevalence of a disease calculated or you know, whether something's occurring more frequently in one population or another, um, that it actually, you know, is something that both, you know, is truthful and, you know, under the result is understandable. And that seems like a weird comment at the end there. But I mean, sometimes, you know, you get a result. It might be true, but, but it's tough to understand what it really means, right? So I think, um, you know, we, we certainly appreciate this 
uh, you know, as, as um, the I2B2 community. And one of the reasons that we've really been focusing on trying to ingrain some of the uh, uh, machine learning and, 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 and computing, right, in creating the digital twin is to give the assurances during that process that, you know, the computed phenotypes are giving you not only, you know, the truthful representation of the patient, but a defined, complete representation, right? And the idea would be, um, and, and Michelle's not here. Where did Michelle go? Okay. I'm almost going to, she's back, all right. And the idea would be that um, as part of presenting a suite of computed phenotypes that maybe in some views, and in fact in the views of many, those would be the only uh, uh, available query items would be those that are assured, you know, through a computed phenotype. And it would be essentially its own ontology, right, of computed phenotypes that would be available. And at some level, you know, it would be simpler and easier to understand. And at another level, it would be more truthful, right, and it would give uh, a better experience, especially to our clinicians and folks that aren't, you know, well invested in understanding all the detail of, you know, how medical informatics works exactly. Um, and so I think, you know, we um, just wanted to entertain this uh, as kind of a, a goal maybe for, uh, you know, let's say three years from now that we actually have something built that can do these kinds of computations and that can actually um, give you a profile in, on a machine that really does, you know, give you that flavor of, you know, having a real digital twin or set of, or, or a population of digital twins that you're working with, which have, you know, real accuracy and completeness. All right. So I think um, that was one, that was one, I guess, uh, and especially with those here, you know, we can discuss that. Um, it would, it would, it would be a, um, it would be one way forward, and it wouldn't, it would be a complementary view in some ways, right? It's not like the raw data is going away, it's still in there. And certainly people could have access to it, and they could have the same exact experience, you know, that we have now. But that would be... In addition, it might even have be in an additional back table in the multi, you know, for as a as a derived data, right? So that's our I think that's the that's one of the one of the ways that the I2B2 community overall and 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 the foundation is looking to go. Um, There's a transmart session. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, do we want to get on with it? I can check to see if they're online. If we are going to start up early. Okay. I can just close in five minutes. Make sure that the thing is pending. If something is remaining for people who are able to complete their exercise, I will be able to. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Just wrap it up. Is there anything else related? Like, were you able to do, or you know, was, was there any any stuff which didn't work? Any feedback on what we could do differently? Yeah, yeah but you know, your 480s. Uh, 480s? It's running something else. It's running something else. No.
Okay, so it should be some other port, right? That's what you're saying, suggesting, right? I mean, it should be, ideally it should be port 443, uh, but it, I mean, what you would run right now would be definitely the private machine. Now this is public, just so that you could play with it, right? But obviously you would be running it somewhere private and you would have a proxy in the front, uh, which would provide the encryption, right? For, uh, at, uh, for, for this. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they didn't go through. Uh, it worked, but okay. Actually, uh, like, uh, um, yes. Uh, CS and, uh, yeah, not for the CSV, but you are right. For the uh, key, key yeah. so when you have the key, I mean that is for logging into any uh, Linux passwordless login. When you have your key, you need to do CH mode six hundred. I was waiting if someone had a, had an issue, but I no one had an issue, or probably just people didn't try. But you need to do CH mode. I did have uh, Justin from back there who's pointed that out to me. And I, I need to call, sh call out, you know, shout out to Justin. I had dinner with him yesterday. And, uh, you know, so Justin has been in this space where he wants to make old analysis very simple for citizen science, right? That's a word for it. And what we're trying to do is that, you know, over here, we want to make this accessible. So that more and more institutions can use it. The fabulous thing about I2B2 is the UI, right? That is the most beautiful thing about about I2B2 is the UI, right? Where clinicians or IT people or you know clinical staff who don't have IT experience can query data. Nowhere do you find such a tool in the ecosystem. Right? That is that that is the power of I2B2. But to make it accessible, it has to be in institutions. And I think this ATL process would be a step towards making it accessible. But the idea of allowing, of taking the IT people out of the way, IT people out of the way, so that they can do better stuff, not be caught up with the same old you know, running of the pipeline, so they can do better stuff. By enabling more users, obviously there'll be more need, right? And so that that, that idea is fabulous. So when I was having dinner with Justin, he mentioned it. I, and in, in I2B2 conference, you have a up, your ups and downs. You know, you go through your moods and you see what's happening and so on. So I was a little bit down yesterday. And when Justin mentioned about citizen science, I kind of felt, oh, you're a bigger fool than me. You know, I, I, we are thinking of making this accessible to clinicians and you're like two steps ahead. It's so inspiring. I felt, I felt so inspired that, you know, uh, about having this drive. And if you have a time, you have time to catch up with him, how much he's been working on making making, uh, you know, data science and the science, it's called fast science, right? fast science, that's the term he said, making, it's sitting right back there, if you want to catch up with him sometime. Uh, but I think that is what we are trying to do here. That is the spirit of what we are trying to do here. We are trying to make, uh, make this accessible for the programmers and for the clinicians is already there. And if you have that table and if you add p values you know, and you have more, maybe graphs, what Tableau does, something like that, Definitely, there'll be more use cases. Uh, okay, any other thoughts on on the exercise or how we could improve? And I told you, like in the concept file, the type is going to go away. There'll be just two columns now in the next version because it will figure out, and we can figure out by scanning the fact what the type is, and the type can be guessed, right? So that's one more less step for the IT person to load data. Uh, and and GitLab. Uh, you have the video in the link. You can watch it later. I don't want to take up everyone's time because there's a few small set of people over here who would really be setting it up, and would love to. You know, when you go back, would love to uh, work with you. And many people here, when we met, many groups are doing ETL, and there's a lot of fabulous work happening. You know, even even on your side about Postgres, the way you optimize Postgres. So I think we need to do those write about those best practices, and we have to build up on on this work. Going to bring the work together. I think those are my thoughts. I want to see if Sean has any any comments on that, or or want to hand it finally hand it back. No, I mean I one. I think if uh, if people have a question that you would like to pose, that would be great. I think. Um, do we know this Rudy? Is it is it? We've got Rudy on deck. Um, Inviting Peter to join as a panelist. Okay. Kavi, I don't know if you want to reconnect us the way we were, or but feel free to take final questions.
question. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll invite I... folks to use the microphone. And I'm sure that, like, after the Transmart stuff, people are like going to want to leave. <laughs> so, so can you do, do a survey? I also like sent an email to everybody. If you you don't feel like doing it now, you know, do, do give it. You know, give us give us your feedback. And it's not. And, and I gave you. I gave places in the survey to just you know free text talk to us about not just this conference, but you know the foundation in general. Like, how can we? You know, how can we better uh, do a better job? Um, there was also a few comments from people about, like, how do people in the community know how to connect with one another? And we don't really have a good mechanism, right? We don't have, like, a Slack channel or... So I don't know. I want to I wanna hear from people. I mean, we have a Facebook page, but there's tons of people who don't like Facebook anymore and I don't have a face. So, you know, maybe Facebook's not right. We have um, a LinkedIn. We have Foundation has a, 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 you know, a LinkedIn site, so maybe LinkedIn. But so give us give us some feedback on how you all can connect with each other, right? Um, because I, I think the, the it's, it's obvious that there's a lot going on here and you're all doing a lot of the same things. And um, so any, any questions or comments or anything about around that? Oh, it's hard sitting here for two days. And the work groups, if you don't wanna join a work group, you can always pop into a work group. On the website, on the event page, there's the link to the work group so you can just pop in if you've got something that you want to like, you know, the, the work group leaders would love people to just pop in and, and talk to, so. All right, I'm going to let the last session go. So let you, yeah. any, anything okay. else from, we'll no? Session you know, session. just, just anything, any, any reflections on, you know, now, later, whatever, you know. Yes, yes, always. I have been on the other side of the street, which was quite interesting as well. Uh, so did you succeed in setting up the connection between the ontology work group and the EPL work group? I think this, this was an, an amazing idea, this one, but it takes a long way to actually make it happen. So wow. Well, is there any successful result of that? The, the two work group leaders so, are sitting next to each other, so it, good, it, yeah, it, yeah. we got to pull them together. Yeah. yeah, yeah they're, 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 I've been saying All that right. for a while, too, and nobody listens to me. I'm so glad to hear you say that. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, well yeah. thanks for bringing that up again. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, I mean, and, and you can see from, from Kavi's demo, I mean, it's like the two things are hand in hand, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, they really, they really you know, that's, that's how you kind of um, build up your data ecosystem is with those two, those, those, those two things. Uh, defining your data and then gathering your data, right? So, yeah. Well, I think as, as Sean said that it's an inefficient white right now. So I, I remember coming to this meeting and in, at the end of the day, don't you give like a roadmap? Right? Is that going to happen after? Normally you have a roadmap, right? Is that anything you talk? Did that happen yesterday? Or yeah, that was yesterday. yesterday. Okay. So, I remember coming to all the previous meetings and always having a question. And my question always was, why just 200 employees? Why just 200 employees? For the first time, maybe 2017, I was like, well, I have this question, but come on, these guys are doing something, you know, I'm not the person to ask this question. Let me learn for a few years and then come back. And then every year I had the question, and just like Sean asked right now, is there anything else? I used to express, why this, why are we just limited to the small community? Why aren't we going, right? And by asking that question, many other people feel the same way, they connect to you. And I think all this work has happened because of those conversations. Right? So if you have that any thought what we should do different, I think this is a good time to speak. Doesn't matter if it's not well formed. You can still even later on get 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 back. All right. All right, great. Well, certainly it was good seeing everybody, that's for sure.